uh, thank you. The, so the next uh, topic is uh, we have is can actually be made quite controversial uh, because <clears throat> in some sense uh, doing a zero base budgeting, you know, and you you are sort of challenging. Do we really need in in, in house lawyers, uh, or or can we do our work uh, or, or deliver the same thing for our businesses by appointing external experts? And uh, I think we we have uh, uh, Usha who who's perhaps perfectly placed to to moderate this because she's been on both sides. So she's been, you know, she started her career as as a counsel. She's been in house for a long time, and she's, um, you know, now again in private practice. So she, you've done, I think, except being a judge, I think you've done every, everything else. So uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> and, and you're you're sort of perfectly uh, placed to to take this. So I'm, we sort of invite you to take this on. And I think uh, it is quite interesting that what your panel uh, throws up for us. That do do you really need us? <laughs> Yeah, good afternoon, friends. Uh, it is indeed a very interesting and I would say sensitive topic. All of us at some stage or the other struggle to find a good general counsel, uh, external counsel and a law firm. Ideally, when, he said, when you said, uh, do we really need in-house counsels, I would like to ask you a question. Do we really need external lawyers? Because I worked with Mahindra. I was heading the group legal function. And most of the group companies used to come to me. So in addition to Mahindra and Mahindra work, we used to do all small group company works. And uh, the philosophy of the group was that as far as possible, you don't go to the external councils. I mean, we had a large team. And right from except litigation, we used to do mostly uh, all the matters in-house, except that in a big transaction, we had to go to the external uh, law firm and some other sensitive matters. But that's not the case with every organization. So at some stage or the other, we have to look for the law firm. And the topic itself is very interesting today. We say uh, we are going to talk about striking the right balance or uh, right chord between the law firm and in-house counsels. Now, we've been always hearing from in-house counsels about the law firms. They're very demanding. They talk about, uh, they negotiate the rates from the law, law firms. I think it is interesting, it will be interesting to hear from the law firms as to what their expectation is from the in-house counsels. Uh, we have panel members who are, it's just a good mix, you know, we have two in-house counsels who will be talking to us in this discussion and we have two partners of an international law firm, uh, law firms. Uh, so I think uh, we have 50-50 uh, participation. Okay, let me invite on the stage, Mr. K. Selvaraj, I think uh, Nina Gupta was supposed to be there, but she could not make it. K. Selvaraj is the director legal of IDFC. He's been working with them for six years, and before that, he was in ING, Vaisha Bank, and Canara Bank for 15 years. So he's a banker in true sense. I would also like to in, uh, call upon uh, Kiran Desai, He's a partner of Mayor Brown. Uh, he is uh, one of the Europe's leading legal practitioners in the area of national and international competition law. Uh, he also advises clients on EU constitutional administrative law. He's a big uh, uh, list of uh, uh, his uh, achievements also. You will hear from him. I would also like to call Kumar Sambasivan. He's a vice president legal with Suzlon Energy. And he's been there for uh, almost two decades as an in-house counsel. And last but not the least, we have with us uh, Richard Gabins, uh, who's a partner of uh, Ashurst. Uh, he's based in London, and uh, he leads one of the Ashurst's four corporate groups and is the head of the India practice. So I would like to welcome all the panelists, and maybe I can take the seat there. And okay. 
So as I said that the discussion will be more on the of course topics which are mentioned. Uh, how can in-house counsel find appropriate counsel for each matter? Now it's I think very important for a general counsel to see when to hire and when not to hire a counsel. As I said, most of the companies would really uh, feel that uh, the in-house lawyer, lawyers should handle or the legal department should handle all the matters. But it's not possible all the time because many a times uh, such expertise is not available with the legal department. Maybe there is a cost constraint and uh, we need to look for a lawyer outside. And then the question comes, who to hire? We, of course, the uh, law firm or the counsel has to be knowledgeable. He must have the relevant expertise. And importantly, it should, it should be cost effective. I mean, in-house counsel, it's, it's a very difficult task for an in-house counsel, I think, to negotiate uh, with the law firm or external counsel so that he can have the best uh, external counsel. And then, of course, how to hire and all. How Normally, uh, the lawyers or law firm who has handled your matters in past or there is a reference which has been given by other counsels, you go to that law firm and uh, some kind of shopping you need to do initially, law firm shopping. And once, uh, once the law firm uh, handles your matter well, I think then you have to decide whether it's a one-time engagement or a long-term relationship. So I think first I will go to the in-house counsels and uh, uh, maybe you start with Kumar. Uh, Kumar, I think uh, you, sh you, you have been with uh, Suzlon Energy and in the uh, corporate sector for a long time. I think we'd like to know what are the challenges you have faced in engaging a proper good law firm and uh, what are the expectations you have had and how you have handled uh, the matters. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the most important thing is, is like, you know, in selecting first is identify and selecting a law firm is that it's internally clear yourself first. Is that, is, what is that internal mandate for you or how do you kind of clear the list for you? And then it's, it's like, what are the objectives in going forward? So that will prima facie guide your selecting the uh, the external law firm, whether you need a law firm which is quite aggressive and close it at a fast rate, or you need a law firm which can, which can go for ready for a long haul and be able to work with you if it is, say for example, there is a, a difference, if it is a, a IPR litigation where uh, there is an interim orders which are quite required and then you uh, handle, recruit a law firm which is specialized in trials, probably that may not be the right fit. So it's like, you no, know, probably we need a person who can go uh, quickly and then able to sort it out. So it's like, you know, the same applies for a transaction as well. So that being the case, I think getting an internal mandate is very, very critical. And once you have an internal mandate, you identify what are the key deliverables. And then based on that, I think it's, it's like, you no, know, obviously the first choice would be uh, with go with the law, recommendation of an existing law firm or there is a uh, in-house counsel, something, a networking forum, something like this. So this is first step number one. And then we have step number two in terms of like, you know, identify the two, three key players in that segment. And then once this, this thing, obviously a little bit of shopping around happens. Right. So then we select the go and select the vendor. And then it's also important, once you select, is identify you are also your key resource from your team or yourself in then so that like you know, use this opportunity to train your internal team in that particular transaction or particular litigation so that it's like you no know, the next time when you come across such an event so you are either yourself able to deal with that effectively or at least substantially bring down the legal cost so i think uh, what you're saying is that in, in in addition to in-house counsel dealing with the external counsel, your whole team should be uh, sort of uh, should be knowing him, dealing with him, and there has to be a kind of a proper communication. Now, I think it, it's very important. Obviously, the general counsel should involve, especially in a big uh, relationship, and but also it's it's a responsibility of the uh, general counsel as a uh, resources person, as a leader. He should ensure that is. Team is trained well. 
and it is like you know, when you go to an external lawyer it is obviously for something which you cannot deliver yourself in terms of whether it's a handicap whether it is a, a very uh, spe specialized area of work or it is a very large transaction where the management wants to ensure at least there is a risk mitigation because your team cannot deliver uh, uh, or it's like you know, a second opinion is needed something of that sort so that way it, it's also very important that you tra train at least a few team members so that like you know, they get exposed to that and then they are able to going forward they are able to handle it much better you can also tell us it's because the companies are normally very conservative about the when it comes to the external counsels to pay them i mean they are very most uh, I, i've seen the company first asking them if you want to hire this xyz uh, law firm it's a very big law firm right what would be the damages you know uh, so i think how to how have you managed to handle i'm sure you must have hired the best law firm uh for a particular transaction so how do you sort of do you sit down with them to negotiate and how how does it how well, does I, i think when i when you ask this question obviously everybody is you are asking this question obviously it's not only intended for me yeah, everybody I mean, has done that everybody, obviously yeah. the thing is that as uh, like no the major thing is that is is again going back to step number 1 is that is what is the internally asked what is the budget right so what is the budget and what are the key deliverables and and obviously the when you are negotiating with the the law firm it's obviously the expectations of both sides should match and expectation from my side is at least like you no know, these are the milestone these are time frames and this is what it is what is included what is not included so that need to be very clearly identified but most of the time the de different this thing is in the heat of the transaction we without get, getting into these kind of hygiene activities we straight away go head on and then probably we get a, a thick bunch of papers as like no that's a quite a surprise that's when it's like no when the management or the internal team says that okay don't waste time on this this like no engage the lawyers bring them on wherever they are right then when they kind of like no you are been completely deserted when the check comes on to you and then it's like no you are you are orphan so therefore it will be prudent to sit down with the law firm and uh, agree to the rates or whatever instead of getting a big surprise yeah well planned activity is almost yes. half the job done maybe let's go to selvaraj and uh, i think uh, the second point as to i'm sure you have hired external counsel so how do you sort of supervise their work and uh, uh, what is the response time like how do you deal with them what is your experience on that uh, uh, first when when we are hiring an external <coughs> lawyer we have to be mindful of uh, you know what type of one is for your organization uh, strategy and important transaction point of view you can have set of law firms who can advise you on key transaction there are other set of uh, law firms who can guide you on routine transactions where not much uh, uh, complexities are involved but the quantum of value may be high there could be an other set of uh, 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 lawyers who can handle your routine uh, small miscellaneous cases like uh, cases in consumer court and other cases this is strategy in our organization we follow what as far as uh, 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 monitoring their work is concerned let me go to the third category third category we have a uh, fixed set of uh, uh, fee informal fee schedule we have these lawyers uh, we uh, while empanning itself we will indicate to these lawyers and these lawyers uh, their performance we review on periodically periodically and if there are any shortcomings are there we will uh, inform that uh, their performance is not uh, up to standard and we have also flexibility to change this lawyer as far as the Uh, other uh, the first point is uh, uh, key uh, transactions where uh, big law firms are involved we are closely involved these transaction because from organization point of view this is very important we it is important for an in-house legal counsel to understand commercial as well as the legal aspect from our organization point of view we do period uh, uh, training to our law officers about financing aspect law uh, uh, finance for lawyers we regularly contact for our inos lawyer officers so that when they uh, discuss with the uh, uh, issues briefing to the external lawyers they can fully
brief that because the stakes are very high. So we constantly be involved in terms of you know, monitoring the progress of work because we are accountable to the management. Uh, th this routine transaction are concerned, no, we have also have, it is good to have a technology support in terms of monitoring cases. For example, you now my current employment, we don't have many litigation. In my previous employment, there, we were into retail banking. There were a large number of litigation, more than uh, 5, uh, 500 cases filed against the uh, company. And there were more than 3,000 cases filed by the uh, bank against various borrowers. How do we manage all this lit litigation? It is better to have a technology to monitor these litigations. And these are all the progress and all it can prompt us in terms of uh, timing. In fact, uh, your technology can help in terms of reducing costs also. Wherever, no, if it is a small case, there is no point in litigating these cases. It is better to uh, write off these cases. Uh, for example, if it is a small case, go for a compromise with all the, these cases. So the technology can support this. So but how do you handle that? As far as a law firm is concerned, they will be very happy to handle the matter as long as possible. <laughs> Sorry for that. But when you said that there is a small matter you would like to uh, go and settle the matter. Yes. What is your experience? Like law firms help you to settle the matter or what sort of uh, advice? The small matters, I feel uh, uh, the in-house councils are better equipped to handle uh, in advising the management in terms of uh, uh, no pros and cons involved, in terms of going for a settlement. If it is a principal issue, we should fight out the case till the uh, uh, logical con conclusion. If it is a small monetary claim, uh, uh, there is uh, no point in litigating. So it is the in-house counsel has to take a proactive take a lead in terms of going for a compromise. You also said that you have periodic reviews with the uh, external counsels. Yes. Uh, what is your experience? Have you been always satisfied with the performance? And if not, have you sort of uh, been frank enough to tell them that, look, I'm not happy with your work? Uh, we are always, you know, with our, in our firm, identifying uh, law firm itself, you know, uh, it is, should meet with our uh, company's uh, strategic uh, objective. You, uh, so we are very cautious in terms of uh, identifying the law firms. Uh, once we identify, we work closely with these law firms. Wherever there is an issue, we are upfront in terms of uh, uh, informing uh, uh, the law firms. Even if it is the biggest law firm, we inform them. Because the law firm reputation may be a good, but some partner who is handling the case, who may not be up to the mark, it is our uh, uh, duty to bring to the notice of uh, their managing partner. In fact, there are instances we have changed even the partner who have handled the case, uh, uh, the transaction on our behalf uh, to some other uh, partner within the same firm. Okay, let's come back, to, come to the uh, law firms. I want to uh, at, uh, uh, request Kiran to give his perspective as to uh, what do you feel regarding the scope of work given to you by the client, by the general counsels, mm -hmm. and what is the value add on that, mm -hmm. and what are your expectations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, in-house counsels? Okay, thanks. I think those are the two words. Um, they say that when you listen to someone speak, you're going to only remember three things. So it's that time of day, so I give you only two things to remember. Scope and value. When I, what I mean by scope is, I think there's a dirty uh, little secret in the legal world, which is that actually many in-house counsel are not very good at instructing external counsel, and many external counsel are not very good at taking instructions. I think um, both uh, parties need to be better um, at this. I um, have perfectly, per personally experienced many... Um, in-house counsel who spend longer choosing their suit with their tailor than they do instructing external counsel. And that doesn't seem quite right. I also have seen many instances where external counsel haven't really got, as you were speaking, uh, Kumar, the sense of what the business goals were um, and have gone in asking for two um, f uh, flowery or generic type um, uh, activity um, and have come away with something different at the end of the day than what they wanted. Um, you wouldn't, it's a bit like going to a shop, thinking in your head, I want, an, uh, I want a sari for some evening do, I, I think maybe dark blue. You come away and it's shocking pink. And you think that wasn't quite right, was it? 
And, you know, this happens on a daily basis because the relationship, uh, the communication between internal uh, counsel and external counsel is not of the quality and of the volume that it should be. Um, so I would say that the scope is, is really a very important element. In terms of the value, I think that's the second uh, very important element. And I think I, I would express it like this. Um, if, uh, you know, what is the value of the bottle of water in front of you? If you're very thirsty, um, perhaps it's $10. If you're not thirsty at all, it's only $1. The water manufacturer can't price like that. So if you went to the supermarket and asked how much is the price of the bottle, you'd be a little bit surprised if the response was, how thirsty are you feeling? And depending on your response, you'd have to pay a price. Um, so the bottle manufacturer just prices at $5 every time. Law firms can, and their clients can, actually vary the price. So if, on a particular occasion, you don't put a lot of value on that particular matter, perhaps because the business doesn't value it very much, then you should um, hopefully get a lower cost, um, a lower fee from your law firm. Uh, but the, there's the other side, which is when you very much value something, you should share that concept with your external counsel. And if you're in a relationship then the highs and the lows come together and it evens out at $5. So the value is, is I think, the point. And I think, for me, the true objective of in-house counsel in terms of fees, external counsel fees, is not to lower the cost of external counsel, but to reconnect the value to the cost. That's my um, mantra, if you will, on, on that particular uh, aspect. And my own experience, um, to, just to go to your third element, um, is very varied. It's very varied, and I think it's about, um, as all of these points really have come through, you know, how well in the, it, did the in-house counsel take instructions from their, from their business? Um, how understanding of the complexities or otherwise of the, of the matter, which may be to do with haven't done it before, so it's sort of new experience for in-house counsel. Um, it may be, uh, sadly, it may be a new experience for external counsel, and they'll get found out, maybe. Um, so all of these sort of variables uh, need to be taken care of. And I, I have seen the whole, of the whole range. But for me, um, of, of the many important pillars uh, in the relationship between the, the two, I would suggest that scope and, and value are, are something that people should focus on. And also maybe whether in-house counsel has briefed you on the business objectives of that particular... Sure, business. which I think is part... I, I would throw that in the valuation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if they don't... If the business really doesn't um, uh, put any value on it, it's more of a mundane, you know, operational, low-key... Low don't put loads of lawyers and a million partners on something when the claim's only $10. Do it when it's $10 million or $100 million. So that's, that's part of the equation as well, I think. Uh, well, Richard, coming back to you... Uh, how, what are your uh, views on this and uh, keeping a sort of a developing a long-term relationship with your client? I think really just, just picking up um, the, the comment that Kumar made, um, from the point of view of external counsel, uh, the most important thing is to manage your client's expectations. Um, and the worst thing that in-house counsel uh, life experience is uh, shocks. So from our point of view, uh, there should be no surprises when it comes to um, uh, the, fi the final bill. Um, I think it very much depends uh, upon whether the instruction is with a new relationship client or an old relationship client. Um, and really just to sort of look at the difference between the two, because I think it would be fair to say, Kieran, that external counsel, we're, we're not really in the business um, for sort of one-off uh, cheap deals. Not ideally, no. um, we're, we're, we're really uh, in, in, in the business to uh, develop long-term relationships uh, with our clients. Um, I, I think the other thing that should be appreciated um, from the point of view of the external law firm uh, is that we're not an unlimited resource. Um, if you look at the pressures being faced by external uh, law firms today, um, we are effectively sort of contracting uh, in size in certain markets um, and uh, expanding uh, in size in other markets. Um, we are also facing uh, constraint uh, and pressure um, 
from legal process outsourcers. Um, and I think that affects both in-house lawyers and external counsel um, because management uh, are looking to in-house counsel uh, to reduce their cost, their overhead. Um, so you see the resource at external law firms shrinking. You see the resource within in-house counsel shrinking. Um, and share, market share is being picked up by the, by, by the legal process outsourcers who are slowly moving up the value chain. So I think we should together uh, bear, bear that in, in, in the back of our mind. I think in terms of developing a relationship uh, with, with, with a new client, um, I take an example of, of, of a new relationship that I developed uh, back in London uh, a, a couple of years ago um, where we did the deal. Uh, we didn't know the client. And, um, and after the deal, the general counsel uh, said, Richard, um, we should use that as a case study um, to, to educate uh, our in-house legal team uh, so they can learn from that experience, um, but also uh, to help us uh, as the in-house legal department um, bring in uh, the business people fr from our company and educate them. And you, on the back of that case study, can help us uh, to educate uh, the business people. Um, and I think the key in any uh, lawyer-client relationship um, is, is you've got to develop that relationship uh, long term. And I think it's much easier uh, with a client who you've acted for long term um, because their strategy, their business objectives and, and, and way of handling matters and, and doing deals, uh, well, it's in your law firm's DNA. And I think the challenge for every external law firm uh, is really to become part of the DNA uh, of their clients. So I think it's like, uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, that there's uh, already a shrinkage of uh, resources from law firms as well as the legal departments. I think it's like a forming a true partnership with your in-house counsels and uh, building that trust at all levels, maybe. So I think, yeah, uh, since uh, we are running short of time. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, I think very good, significant points uh, have been evolved. Uh, as Kumar said that, uh, you know, before engaging an external firm, he would rather sit down and uh, plan a budget and have some kind of budgetary expectations from the law firms. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we heard that different lawyers, uh, they hire for different works. Uh, and there is a periodical review. In fact, I would say there is a review after a particular transaction will also help as to, uh, you know, what are the improvements needed for the further uh, transaction. So I think that the periodical review is very important. And as Selvira said, that uh, sometimes you have to be very frank with the external counsel, the kind of service they give, because ultimately you are the customer and uh, you need to sort of... Uh, uh, define what your objectives are. On the other hand, when we heard uh, Kiran and Richard, I think they have spelled out their expectations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the in-house counsels as to how they would like to have a long relationship with the companies and uh, what is the scope. I mean, they, both of them had the same uh, problem. I would, I, they said either the proper instructions are not given or taken I think so that point has been noted. And uh, basically, that will be the value add, as Richard says, that he has to, at some times, you need to even uh, educate your legal department people and share your experiences. And that was, a, uh, that was another point. Uh, so anything else uh, the panel, panelists want to add? Or we can go straight for the questions? Or uh, if I may, points? I think I would just Please. add... add um, one of the, one of the um, evolutionary points in general that we see is that large corporations, um, often because of a, sh of a shrinking in-house uh, legal team, but also, uh, frankly, because of, an, of a reduced budget um, that they've allowed uh, to spend, 
are seeking to reduce the number of law firms and to create um, synergies, uh, frankly, to create greater bargaining power so they can leverage for a, a net better price. Um, and, and in general, I think that that's um, a good thing, but there is a challenge because it does mean that um, law firms partly meet their uh, desire, as Richard expressed it um, very well, which is to have this long-term relationship with the client. But the lower value work, as well as the higher value work, starts going into the same law firm. For law firms, depending on the nature of the law firm, that can be acceptable because you're taking your, your average value between the high mega transactions and that lower, perhaps HR, uh, regular operational work. And you'll have to have the teams on the ground. And you have to have conversations with in-house counsel to say, you know, this is the way we'd like to operate. So you make sure you have the right people on the ground to do that, perhaps lower level HR work. Because the upside is when we do a transaction where we have some financing work or whatever it happens to be, you'll get it. Um, and it's a partnering um, relationship. So I think it's an evolutionary point. I, I think I see it more and more. It happens either informally or it happens uh, because of panel processes. So I think that's all good. Um, just to be controversial, because I think that was uh, perhaps one request. Um, I think that uh, in-house counsel using external procurement uh, consultants to obtain uh, the best uh, legal service at the lowest legal price um, is not something I believe uh, that is good uh, ultimately for, for you as, as, as clients. I don't actually think it's good for the profession either. Um, so that's my uh, little pitch on that one point. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, in order to develop a long-term relationship, even law firms are sometimes open to, even uh, uh, for the fee structure, they're open to have a kind of a fixed fee or uh, even maybe contingency fee to do that? Uh, where where law, local bar rules allow, you can yeah. do that, yes. Or maybe a capped a fee or maybe sometimes a retainer uh, arrangement also works. So I think that relationship is very important. Yeah. You want to say something? Just, just one other uh, ch challenge for e external law firms um, is I think more and more frequently uh, in-house counsel uh, are telling us uh, that, that they're not prepared to pay uh, for the work of trainees mm. or very junior lawyers. Um, they don't want a partner on the job because he or she is far too expensive. Uh, but we want that senior associate. Um, so, you know, there is a, there is a danger, uh, I, I think, of, of partners not being at the coalface because uh, the, the, they are priced too expensive. Um, but, but, the, but the one cause I really want to um, champion is, is, is really for, for the young junior lawyers and the trainees. Um, how are they going to get the experience and how are they going to learn on the job? And um, you know, I think we see it a lot uh, in, in some of the law firms in India. There's some fantastic uh, young lawyers, brilliant talent when they all come out of NLS uh, with distinction sort of 70%, 80% uh, plus, they can produce a fantastic note uh, on, on legal aspects. Um, but how commercial um, is, is, is that advice? Um, I, I learned the hard way in that uh, when I started at Ashurst, uh, there was no such thing uh, as a precedent uh, or a standard document. And my first uh, M&A transaction uh, I was assisting a very senior partner, um, and we received a document from that well-known law firm called Slaughter and May. Um, and uh, my partner, Mr. Walker, said, well, Richard, um, because we were, we were selling um, the company, he said, well, Richard, just produce a markup. Um, I had no idea how to produce a markup. I'd never done an M&A deal before. Um, so I sort of searched around for a few precedents and had a, had a word with a, f a few sort of senior colleagues, uh, and I produced what, you know, what I considered to be a, a hack version uh, of a markup of a sale and purchase agreement. Uh, th this was almost 30 years ago, just to show you how old I am. Um, and then we had a meeting. We, the, we, we were doing a deal with um, uh, Caterpillar, 
uh, the, 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 the American company and, and, and uh, we were selling the business to, to Caterpillar. So all the Americans rolled in with their general counsel and we had about 30 people uh, round uh, the meeting table. Um, and I went in and you know, I thought my position in life was to you know, give everyone some water and pour some tea and pour some coffee. Um, my copy of the markup was distributed uh, around the table. And I sat next to Mr. Walker and I breathed a huge sigh of relief thinking, well, I've done my job. He's going to lead and take the meeting. So we went around the table and we introduced each other. Uh, we went all the way around. Of course, it came around to me and I uh, introduced myself. Uh, and Mr. Walker turned around to me and said, Richard, uh, it's your document. Uh, you marked it up. Take us through it. And that is how I learned. So I think my worry today is the younger lawyer, they've got all the precedents, they've got all the standard documents, they've got all the previous deals. They also have uh, something called the internet. So, so all the information is out there. Um, and I think the challenge for us as external counsel, and I think if I could throw the gauntlet also over to, over to in-house counsel, um, please help us develop our young lawyers. Please help us develop the stars of the future. Please help those stars of the future develop internal relationships with your colleagues and please let them grow up together because when your junior colleague becomes general counsel, we would very much like our trainee, when he or she is a partner, to have developed that relationship um, over the course of a few years. So please help us in that regard. That was really... Uh, good. So, uh, just to sum up, I think uh, both sides have made it very clear that the, uh, you make your objectives very clear, give proper instructions, uh, take proper instructions, and that has to be, I think, uh, a constant communication. I think communication is very important at all levels. Uh, general counsel as well as his team uh, should meet up with the external councils and there has to be a proper communication. Uh, then Richard talked about part, uh, forming a true partnership or relationship and I think that building that trust uh, at all levels is also very important. Uh, as uh, Sylvan said that uh, be frank, uh, proper, again proper communication, if you are happy, not happy, communicate. And you have to remember that you are the customer. So you can develop that friendship or relationship with the, with the external counsel, but remember, keep the, uh, keep the work product professional. Keep that professionalism that you are the customer. And I think I would say that holding even a, a post-work conference really helps. I don't know how many, how many of us uh, do that. Uh, and uh, reset expectations periodically. I think these are the, uh, some of the learnings we have... Uh, got. Uh, now, can we, can we ask, the, ask from the audience? Yeah, sure. No, I, I think to get the best out of uh, the law firm, it is important that we also elevate as in-house counsel to a next level. In terms of like, no, I think most of the time what happens is that the in-house counsel does all the mundane work. It's just like, you know, especially churning out the MIS report the way in which your CFO <laughs> wants or somebody wants. It's like, no, these are the things which takes a lot of time. And, and one of the mandates which at least like, you know, I have negotiated is that my, me and my team will only work non-repetitive strategy work. Okay. So the expectation was that how are you going to do, to do that? Leave that to me. I will do that. Okay. Today at least like, you know, I am almost 70-75% there where there is it's like, you know, we avoid a lot of regular compliance level, this thing being automated. There is so much of like, you know, uh, uh, lawyers build moving in an automated way and there was like no our team is freed from these mundane thing so that you handle one is strategic non repetitive work so that is like no the level at which you interact with the external law firm the quality is also much better rather you get into bogged down by your mis report which has to go tonight versus you are able to spend much more time with robert and mm. <laughs> right so Kira, so that way is the quality of time is better and also the, the input which 
be delivered is also much better. I think it is one of the key inputs is, is that if we can get free to the large extent from the re non repetitive work to that extent definitely it will be better. Just one, I just want one point. The complexity of the transactions have uh, increased over a period of time. Their involvement is very much is required to handhold the uh, uh, in-house legal department. The end-to-end -end, uh, uh, you know, taking a responsibility from the law firm side is very important. And uh, what happened, especially in our country like here, uh, we get a good law services from maybe law firm here, Delhi, Bombay and all. But the same contract dispute may come in Chhattisgarh where we may not get a good lawyers. Most of the time we don't get. That time the, law, um, uh, the key challenge is finding a lawyer. There were the uh, law firm which structure the documentation. They need to get involved in the entire process. Okay. Uh, we can take some questions from the audience. If you have anything to ask to the panel members. Yes. <clears throat> Our experience has been that to seek a two-page opinion, when we finally get it, one and a half contains caveats, assumptions, and some more, you know, underlying statements. So how do you expect in-house counsels to really play a role, a very, very aggressive, proactive role, if this is the kind of support that we are going to finally get? And what we are looking for is really not there or not clearly spelled out. Kiran, maybe you would like to respond to that? I think actually probably Rob would be better than you. <laughs> probably get closer to me. Well, I can, I can offer an opinion. Uh, I'll do it after you. Yes, I can. Um, I think actually your last phrase, you, you don't get much in the opinion, is an opinion, I suspect, uh, these days, uh, particularly if it's in the finance world, is my experience. Um, they, they, they are impenetrable documents with mystic language, um, saying very little. But, um, and, and they're required uh, these days... Uh, for, for, for certain aspects, and I suspect like um, one of the previous speakers was talking about, um, it's a bit like ticking the boxes, no, 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 and it, the opinion is there. I think in other matters, for example, in a, maybe a, a significant litigation where you're looking for an opinion as to the, uh, is it likely to succeed ultimately or not, um, there you're likely to get not one and a half pages, I would suggest, but actually hopefully something quite significant and meaningful uh, when you read it. So it may depend upon um, the type of opinion that you're looking for, but I, I certainly agree with you from my own experience, and I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not in the finance space and I'm not in the tax space, but when I read tax and finance opinions, I wonder why you bothered in the first place. But, uh. <laughs> I, 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 I have to and I'll make a bold sweeping comment. Um, in my view uh, and in my experience, opinions are not worth the paper they're written on because of the assumptions. I agree with you 150%. Uh, in that regard. Um, if you want legal advice, a, a commercial legal view uh, on a topic, then we will give you that uh, commercial legal view in a letter uh, rather than an opinion. Um, I get very cross when it comes to uh, discussing uh, opinions. And I, I was advising uh, a, a client on an underwriting in London a few years ago um, Again, that famous law firm, Slaughter and May, were on the other side. Um, and uh, my clients were an English company and uh, board of directors uh, in London. And um, uh, they wanted uh, a legal opinion. I said, no way. Uh, you can see that our board of directors have the authority uh, to enter this transaction. Uh, you can come on to the board meeting if you like. And I will supply you. Uh, with, a, with a certified uh, copy of that board minute, duly authorising uh, the entering into this transaction. Um, that still uh, wasn't satisfactory as far as the American bank uh, was concerned. Uh, I told my clients that uh, if, if we have to provide this uh, legal opinion, it will cost them uh, an extra £15,000. Why? Because I'm afraid law firms are going the same way as the accountancy profession, which I think is very sad. Uh, the accountants profession have their technical committee, so the accountants cannot sign off on anything uh, without their technical committee approving it. And I'm afraid uh, global law firms today, uh, they cannot issue an opinion uh, without their opinions committee uh, signing off on it. So um, I think it's a sad reflection 
the, the way the world is going uh, with, with, with opinions. I agree entirely with Kieran. It is a tick box exercise. Uh, it's a complete waste of time, uh, in my view. And if clients want the advice, then we will give it to them in a letter. That's interesting. Okay, I think we are running out of time. Out of time. Yeah, sure. There's this ROI which is mentioned here. So, uh, in, in, the, in the opinion of the panel, on one side, we've seen that there has been sort of, for want of a better word, a mushrooming of, of uh, smaller law firms. Uh, on the other side, we've seen companies like IDFC, you know, which does, uh, has formed internal capabilities for doing work. I mean, I've recently read one, uh, a paper which has been published by IDFC for, for project financing and, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. So, so there is, so one side is there, uh, there's these big law firms who you, were, you would use for only selective matters. Uh, would you, is, is, it, is it a trend you believe as a panel that uh, the smaller work which is there, you know, as he's saying, that the, the more mundane work you would now give it to uh, smaller law firms and uh, you would have a core team who will do in-house strategic matters and have a core, uh, you know, team internally. Uh, is, is that some kind of a trend now and is that a better way of doing things for, you know, the days of cost pressure and all that good thing? First thought, if you like. I, think, I mean, I think, from my perspective, I, I agree with you. If you look at that, uh, particularly I see in India, actually, this, this situation that you described. Um, I, from an international law firm's perspective, I have uh, the concern in a number of areas, um, uh, something of a re reflection also of the concern that Richard expressed, that actually if the mundane, perhaps even slightly all easy to do work, is not available to be done by the international law firms. How can we grow the junior lawyers through to become um, better lawyers? Because they won't have had the early experience. If I take um, you know, regular uh, HR advice on you know, what are the, the, the employment contract with you know, one of the many car workers in the factory, all that sort of stuff. There's going to be hundreds of these documents. They're all, they're all of a like. Um, but you have to, have to know how to work them. Because you can't be just qualified on Monday and start um, work on the board member's um, employment contract. Um, this, you've got to go through the, the growth curve. So I think that's the challenge with that, uh, th that factual pattern. So, so Karen, I, mean, I, mean, I, hear you. I think it, it, this is perhaps a little more true in India right now. I mean, I don't know about the, the international context, but in India, I, I can certainly see it, it's happening. So I, I, I really want to hear... Perhaps a little from a, you know, do you all, you all may not face that, so I, but I wish I had, uh, you know, uh, also an Indian yeah. law firm, you know, partner here to answer that. Uh, but not having that benefit, at least from the, from the in-house counsel, Anusha, your Maybe experience. I can, I can add uh, to that. Uh, so when I was working with Mahindra, as you know, that it's a very diversified company and we had uh, a big uh, legal team and uh, used to be, has to have litigation like about, thousand uh, consumer cases and a couple of some 300 or 500, uh, 138 cases and a lot of litigation. So I think what we used to do is to uh, really sit down and work out as to how it's going to be cost effective for the company. And we used to have, uh, uh, we used to have individual lawyers who were, who were, uh, who were handling day-to-day -day, you know, consumer cases and 138 cases. And we used to negotiate with them a kind of a deal, not per case or in a very uh, sort of a consolidated payment kind of a thing. Uh, also, only for the uh, important matters like where we very high stakes were involved in like transactions, acquisitions, mergers and all, we used to go to very good uh, law firms. Uh, generally, rest of the documentation and other things we used to handle in-house. And in very uh, uh, few cases where we used to think the documentation is also very sensitive and need to be vetted by the law firms, we used to uh, go to the law firm. So I think that when uh, Selvaraj also said that they go to different lawyers, I think that makes it very uh, cost effective for the company also to, to understand and identify. Instead of going to one law firm for everything, I think we need to sit and uh, work out the costs. Just to share one thought uh, from cost saving point of view. When I joined an IDFC in 2006, 
uh, our balance sheet was around 12,000 crore. Uh, total law officers around uh, seven, eight people. Now we are 12. Our balance sheet is around 60,000 crores. Plus we have so many other group companies we have formed, <coughs> investment banking we have bought from. The entire thing, most of the work, 90% of the work is managed by a nose line. Our uh, business well, model well, is why, also like, Why is that? Why would you... Why would we, you uh, in terms of uh, turnaround time and the accountability point of view, because in our kind of transaction end to end, till the account is closed, uh, it is better to manage a nose. Because we will be, the entire uh, life cycle of the account, there could be so many issues. So the in-house lawyer, in our uh, system, no, each uh, a deal, a deal officer is identified. He will be part of the deal team, the business side, right from the identification till the closer of the account. So he will be there the entire life cycle of that. He, he may be interacting with external lawyers or uh, uh, other consultants, but he is accountable overall in terms of Okay, I think I've got uh, the signal that we are running out of time. Any other questions or maybe somebody wants to quickly, just one or two questions, maybe we can take. Uh, or someone wants to share their experiences with us. Okay, if not, then we can put an end to this session. Thank you very much, all the okay, sure. panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sure.